let, let's finish up this this story of of um, uh, of uh, have finding similar documents uh, by talking about the locality sensitive hashing step it, step itself. In this case, I'm going to talk in particular about a locality sensitive hashing for min hash signatures, and then I'm, I'm going to, in the next set of slides, I talk about uh, some other applications that look a little bit different. Um, again, the, the general idea behind locality sensitive hashing is that uh, you want to come up with a relatively small list of candidate pairs that actually have to be checked for similarity. Uh, you don't want to have to do it for all pairs. Um, and assuming now that my, the things I'm looking for, uh, uh, I want to find similar signature matrices, uh, similar columns of the, similar, uh, of the signature matrix. Um, what I want to do is I want to hash the columns using several different classical hash functions. And I will look at any pair of columns that winds up in the same uh, bucket at least once. Okay, so uh, first of all, I'm going to pick a, 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 some similarity threshold. What does it mean to be similar? Well, I'll pick a number between 0 and 1, uh, a threshold t that says, if the Jacquard similarity is at least t, then I want to declare these two sets to be similar. Uh, and therefore, if the, if the signatures are at least fraction t similar, then I want to declare their un the sets that they came from to be uh, similar. Um, okay, so again, we'll make all those. Okay, well, I mean, ideally, what we want is that the o that only the columns that agree in at least fraction t of their, of their signatures or, or rows uh, will become candidate pairs. Obviously, we're not going to get exactly that. Okay. Uh, but again, it's a, the, the after doing the, the, uh, uh, the min hashing, at least fraction t of the, of the slots for the two columns c and d are, are the same. <coughs> Okay, so again, I, I want to hash the columns uh, several times. I, I guess I sort of said this before. Okay, um, uh, okay, so so let's let's focus on on how we do the the hashing of a single column. So the the purple thing is is a, is a column, and uh, it corresponds to one signature. Uh, I'm going to divide the rows into B bands of R rows per band. So B times R is the total number of rows that I have available. And then a hash value will be either the segment of the column in one band, or since there may be just too many possible values, I'll hash them down to some reasonable number of buckets, like a million. Okay, so as I said, the matrix, and this is the signature matrix, divided into B bands, uh, R rows per, per band, and uh, each of my hash functions corresponds to one of the bands. For each of these hash functions, then I look at the value of, the sort of the vector of values in that band for each column. I hash it to a bucket, try to use as many buckets as I can physically uh, handle. Um, and then I, I, I guess I keep saying the same thing over and over again. The candidate column pairs will be those that hash to the same bucket in at least one of the bands. Okay, and uh, I do have some flexibility as to what B and R are, and I'll show you roughly how you want to pick B and R to optimize the, um, for that as, as a function of the threshold that you want, so that you have few false positives and false negatives, as, as few as possible. And obviously, the, the larger the signatures are, the, more the, the larger the product of B and R is, the better you can do 
in eliminating false positives and, and negatives. Okay, so again, here's one of the hash functions corresponding to one of the bands, and each column gets hashed to a bucket. Um, and for for example, um, columns, the last two columns, six and seven, they hash the different buckets, so they're surely different. In, in that uh, in that band, that is, uh, this vector and that vector surely differ because if they were the same, they they would hash the same bucket. Uh, on the other hand, columns two and six, they might be the same. That is, this and this might be the same, or this could be a surprise collision, but probably they are the same. Okay, assuming we have a, a large enough number of, of, of buckets. But here we assume that only if they are identical, they would. I would like it that only if they are identical in that band, mm -hmm. do they hash to the same bucket. But since that's probably too many buckets, mm -hmm. I might get some some collisions. And again, that will be false positives, pairs that get compared for no good reason, mm -hmm. and are, are found not to be similar. Okay, so I, I want to just just to to be a little bit specific. I'm going to assume, assume 100,000 columns. That's 100,000 different sets, and I'm using 100 integers, uh, 100 hash, 100 min hash functions. So my signatures are of length 100, um, and this is a very small data set now. Okay, it's it's only 40 megabytes worth of um, of data. So I can fit the signatures into main memory. I can I can hash them, compare them, uh, very efficiently. Um, okay, and I'm assuming my threshold will be eighty percent. Okay, that is, I'd like the Jacquard similarity to be of, of the underlying sets to be eighty percent at least, or uh, in terms of the signatures, at least eighty out of the hundred rows will agree. Now I have, uh, if you think about it, there are five billion pairs of signatures, uh, and that's in these days it's probably doable, but but kind of painful. So let's hope we can avoid doing most of them. Uh, I'm going to choose 20 bands, five uh, integers per band. Again, that's five times uh, 20 is 100. Now let's look at at two columns that just meet the threshold. That is, they're 80% similar. Now, what are the probability that they will be identical in a band of five rows? Well, it's 0.8 to the fifth power, and that's 0.328. Okay. Now, if you think about it, that's not too good, right? That says, even if the band, if, the, if these sets are 80% similar, in any particular band, they only have like about a third of a chance of being found to be uh, to become candidates. Okay. Well, on the other hand, so what? Wh what is the probability that they will not become candidates due to any one band? Well, it's one minus the probability that they are identical, which again is about two thirds, raised to the twentieth power. And if you do the math, it's it's about a thirtieth of a percent. Okay, it's a very tiny number. So about one in three thousand of the the truly eighty percent similar sets will become false negatives. They will never be looked at. Okay. Now let's look at two columns that are 40% similar. Well, what are the, what's the probability that they will agree in all five rows of a band? Well, it will be 0.4 raised to the fifth power, which is about 1%. Okay, so uh, they have 20 shots to become candidates. Um, since they're more or less almost independent, um, the probability that um, that that the two columns will become candidates, 
because of any one of the 20 bands, you've got roughly a 1% chance in each of 20 bands. So it's about 20%. Now that's quite a bit. That says uh, among the, the columns that are 40% similar, you do have about a 20% chance that they will become false positives and, and have to be checked. Um, now, this number, the fraction of false positives goes, goes down very rapidly as the, um, uh, as, as the, uh, the underlying Jacquard similarity gets down below 40%. Um, the interesting thing is, I mean, there aren't too many web pages that are 40% similar in this, in this sense. Either, it, you know, they might hit 80% if they really are mirrors or plagiarisms or something like that. But if they're just unrelated pages, they're really not going to be 40% similar. They might, that's, you know, there'll be time they'll be 1% similar or something like that. Uh, so you don't have to worry about this too much. It, it, um, you don't actually get that many false positives. Okay. So uh, what I'd like to just just to finish up with is, is sort of try to dr draw some diagrams that that sort of show you what 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 you actually what this 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 process actually gives you. So this is sort of the ideal. Okay, um, again, the, 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 uh, the horizontal axis is the actual similarity of two sets, of, 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 of sets, and T is the threshold value above which we want to declare them similar. And then the question is, we'd like the probability of sharing a bucket, we'd like that to be zero if the actual similarity is less than t, and would like it to be 1 if it's above t. Okay, well, we obviously can't get that. But, okay, what do you get if you simply do use one min hash function? Well, if you remember, there's a theorem that says the probability of sharing a bucket, which now means uh, that the, the min hash values are the same is exactly the similarity of the sets. So it's, it's linear. Well, okay, that's not anything like the step function I just showed you, but at least it's, it's hard in the right place. It's, it's going in the right direction. Okay? <laughs> okay. And now the trick, the, what, what the, the locality sensitive hashing is doing is it's amplifying the goodness of this triangle picture to give you something uh, uh, to, to that will give you something that's sort of a step function at, at t. Now, um, I, I just want to remind you, you can think of the area on, uh, be to the left of the threshold and below the line as representing the false positives. That, that is, um, well, if the similarity is zero, the probability of sharing a bucket is really very tiny. As it gets up toward T, there's a fairly high probability of sharing a bucket. Anyway, so, so you can think of this area as representing all the false positives. And similarly, you can think of these as representing the false negatives. Uh, again, because the similarity is above the threshold, you would like to say they share a bucket, but, you know, if the actual similarity is, is one, they will surely share a bucket, but if it's just T, might not share a bucket anyway. Okay, so, uh, so this area represents the false negatives. Now, the function, the probability of, uh, sh of sharing at least one bucket when you have B bands of R rows, it's sort of, uh, I'm being a little bit too optimistic there, but, uh, but it's, it, but it's, it's cl gets close to a step function. L let me explain what it looks like. Um, okay, s to the power r, again, s is the simil actual similarity of, of the underlying sets. So s to the r is the probability that all the r rows of one band are equal. Okay, and then one minus that 
will be the probability that at least one row in a band is are not equal. And then if you raise that to the b power, you've got the probability that no bands are identical. And then uh, I guess the last thing you want to do is 1 minus that is the probability that at least one band is identical. So this, uh, again, you may not see it, but, but the function I have here, 1 minus the quantity, 1 minus s to the r, all raised to the b, is something like a step function. So I thought, oh, and, and by the way, the threshold, the point at which the rise will occur is approximately 1 over b to the 1 over r power. So that tells you, um, again, presumably b times r is, is fixed. That's the number of min hash functions you've chosen. You want t to be approximate, you know, to tell you how to divide b and r, uh, uh, or divide the product between b and r, uh, you want the threshold to be, uh, approximately what, what I have there, 1 over b to the 1 over r. Okay, so for the case I was working out, uh, b is uh, 20 bands, 5 rows per band, band, this is what that function looks like. Now, it's not exactly a step function, but, but look, um, up to s equals 0.3, the function stays pretty low, and then up to 0.7, it does rise quite a bit. That is, its rise is about 0.9 in a distance of 0.4. So its, its slope is over 2, right? So it really, it really is kind of flat. Then it heads up, again, not straight up the wall, but, but its slope is bigger than 1, which, which was the original, the, 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 the diagonal. And then above 0.7, it and flattens out again. So it, it's not so bad. Okay, so let me do, just try to summarize. Uh, I want to, um, uh, again, you, ha you, have, you have R times C is fixed. You want to pick R and C in the number of uh, a number, um, I was R and B, I would guess, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, to, uh, you know, so that you get the right threshold. Um, and again, uh, in the, the original papers on the subject, they sort of do the math as to how, what the real number of, of false positives and false negatives are. But, but this is where you really need, what you really need to do. Uh, and then, once you've, you've, bucket, you've, you've got the buckets, you have to look inside the bucket and compare all the pairs within a bucket to see if they really do have similar signatures. Now, again, remember the signature similarity is just an approximation for what the, under, the similarity of the underlying sets is. Uh, so you can uh, then, if you find that the signatures for two sets are similar as signatures, you can go back to the original sets and make sure that they are themselves a signature. That gets rid of some false positives because it doesn't help you with false negatives. If you've never considered a pair, uh, you're still not going to consider it. Okay, so um, that's sort of the, the, the main thread. And what I want to do now is go over just a couple of related applications. And I want to talk about three things uh, which are listed here. That ent uh, entity rev resolution, a uh, problem of fingerprints, and a problem involving similar news articles. Um, okay, now entity resolutions, it's, it's actually a, a big and, and quite interesting problem. You have a collection of records, um, the records may have different fields, but they often uh, will refer to the same entity. Um, and the typical, uh, the typical application is where these entities are people. Um, and and uh, I'm going to just assume that the entities really are, are people. Uh, and the idea is you want to merge the records if they have, you know, 
if, 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 they ref if you think they refer to the same person, uh, you know, one may have the person's cell phone uh, number, the other may have a landline number. You'd like to, to identify that they're really the same person and m have one merged record in which you have both, both phone numbers for that individual. Um, okay, so this is actually based on a real story. Okay, uh, some lawyers consulted me. Uh, there was a lawsuit in between two companies. I'm still not allowed to tell you what the companies are. Uh, just call them A and B. Uh, a agreed to obtain customers for B, and B was supposed to pay A a fee for each customer that, that A uh, signed up for B. They then had a falling out, and they started arguing over how many customers B had that had originally come from A. Of course, they never bothered to make a record of that. That is, A didn't have a field in their records that say, this was a customer that we handed off to company B, and B never had a field that said, we got this customer from company A. Um, the s so the size of the databases they each had was about a million records each. Okay, and that's that's you know, time. This is it's a big data course, right? This is not big data, but the number of pairs of records—a million versus a million—pretty large. And um, oh, and by the way, the lawyers had a PC, and. <laughs> They were writing the, the code in Visual Basic. And, um, and, and so, you know, even if I wanted to do something really heavy duty, I, I, I couldn't. Um, and, uh, okay, but, but, you know, even today, again, a trillion records, a, pair, a trillion pairs of records, not that easy to wade through and, and decide do these represent the same customer. Now, the problem is each of the records had a name, an address, and a phone. Uh, but since they were kept by different companies, they could be different. There were, uh, there were typos. Um, uh, some records would be kept up to date. Uh, I mean, if you were a customer of B, you didn't bother informing customer A that you had moved. Uh, but you wanna, uh, you'd have to inform B because they were the ones prov actually providing the service. So the first thing we did was we designed a score to measure how many, uh, how similar the name, address, and phone number in two records were. So um, we, we, we put a, gave 100 points to each of the three fields. So if you were identical in each three, you got a score of 300. Turned out of the two million records, there were about 7,000 pairs that got this perfect score. Very tiny number. <coughs> and we, I think we found about 180,000 pairs that were probably the same person. Uh, okay, so, uh, you know, this, well, there are misspellings or variant spellings. Um, in the United States, they're always changing your area code. Uh, you know, so, uh, again, you might keep it up to date keep the area code up to date in one company and not the other. So, so you have two phones that agree in the last seven digits but not the first three. That's still very possibly the same phone. Um, and so what we want to do is we want to score the pairs of records and report the high scores as matches and hope that the judge would agree that these were in fact the same person. Uh, as I said, a million squared uh, is, we, we didn't really want to look at each pair and just score them and then report just all the high scores. So what I did was I devised a, a, a locality sensitive hashing technique much simpler than what I just talked about. Um, I used exactly three hash functions and the hash functions were the exact value of the name, the exact value of the address, and the exact value of the phone number. Uh, and then we were going to compare records if they agreed in at least one of those three. Um, 
And, and by the way, you know, if you have two records that represented the same person, but there were little tiny errors in each of the three fields, uh, we would never look at them. And, and by the way, we had some, uh, we did some sampling and we kind of believed that there were about 2,500 pairs uh, of that type that we never looked at, but that were the, really the same person. Uh, but we had no basis for do, for for that, but that gives you a rough rough idea of what the number of, of false uh, false ne uh, false negatives were. Okay, um, so you might say, well, how are we going to hash the names uh, so that you get a bucket for each possible string? Again, that that's too many buckets. Uh, so, we, we, but we didn't actually have to. We just sorted the records by string. And since there are only a, two sets of a million records, sorting them by name or sorting them by address, not a big deal. You, that, that's quite easy to do. And once you got that, then you know exactly how many records have exactly the same name then would be those records that have another name in common and, and a, a third name in common and so on. Okay. Um, now, okay, so we did this, we, we, we found the candidates, there weren't too many candidates. Uh, most of the candidates we scored had pretty high scores. Uh, but the trouble was, we couldn't be sure how high a score do you have to have to be the same person. Okay, turns out out of, the three, uh, out of um, 300, the answer is 185. Uh, using our scoring system. Uh, how did we figure that out? Well, it, it turns out, th again, remember what was happening. Company A was signing someone up, and then they had to go and register with Company B to get the actual service. Now, the average time it took the, those people to do that was 10 days. How do we know that? Well, we have the gold standard, the 7,000 pairs that were identical, that no judge would deny represented the same people. Okay. Now, what about bad match? Suppose you had a false match. We said this record represents, and these, these two records represent the same people, but they're, but they're different people. Well, the, then the times at which they signed up would kind of be random. Right. Well, turns out that another thing we did to eliminate uh, uh, having to look at too many pairs was we didn't even bother to look at two records if their creation dates were, were not within 90 days of each other. And, and, and of course, the company B record was later than the, than the company A record. Um, so we know right away that if, if I pick two random uh, uh, records, uh, they will, on the average, be 45 days apart. If they were, uh, again, if they were, if they were in fact candidates. Okay. So we said, let's look at look at the um, all those pairs of records that have a score of 185. Now we can compute the average time difference for those pairs, say call it X. And again, if you do the math, um, I'll let you think about it. You know, again, I it's going to consist of some number of real matches and some number of, of random matches. The real matches will have an average of 10 days in difference. The random matches will have 45 days. Uh, if we have an average time difference X, then the, th then the fraction of the matches that are valid matches will be 45 minus x over 35. Okay, so for example, if, if x were 20, then 5 sevenths of the matches would be valid. Unfortunately, which 5 sevenths we didn't know. Okay, and this became sort of a sticky point, you know, when, whenever you deal with people who just don't understand math, uh, you know, to say, well, we know five-sevenths of these guys are, are, you know, 
B owes A for five sevenths of them, but we can't tell you which ones. They didn't buy that. I mean, okay. Anyway, uh, not important. Well, it, it seemed important at the time. What kind of, um, and, and, and by the way, uh, okay, we were sort of fortunate to have this, this um, uh, sign-up time to, to do validation, but I just want to point out that you can, um, in almost any situation like this, you can validate in more or less the same way. So hypothetically, suppose, again, uh, records represent individuals and there's a height field. Okay, if, the, if it's a valid match, you'd expect the heights to be pretty much the same. Again, there may be some noise, and a measurement noise or something. But if, they, if, if they're unrelated, then the difference in heights will be whatever the average difference in height is for two random uh, people. Uh, and you can do exactly the same calculation. Okay, so again, I'll, I'll let you think about that. But uh, I want to talk about fingerprint matching. Um, and uh, again, th this is, it, it's again, it's a kind of matching of sets, but here the set, the statistics of the sets are very different from what they are in, um, in the min, in the, the shingling min hashing kind of thing. So, um, uh, anyway, anyway, I, I want to just talk about this. It, uh, it, it, it basically wind up the same place, but, but the, the numbers come out rather differently. Okay, so first of all, um, when they take your fingerprints, um, they don't really store them as an image. They store them as a set. And um, the sets are positions in which they're what are called minutiae. Um, and if you look, if you look, and if you look at, your, at your fingerprints, and don't everybody do it right now, but, uh, uh, you'll find that there are, there are ridges and occasionally an interesting thing uh, happens. A ridge will end the end, the location at which the end occurs, that's a minutia. Uh, sometimes ridges branch, and the branch point is a minutia. Um, and your fingerprints are stored as the locations of those minutia. Okay, so we're gonna put a grid on the fingerprint. Uh, okay, first thing you want to do is you want to make sure that the fingerprints are normalized in scale, so, so that the grids. The, the fingerprints will more or less overlay if, if they're the same fingerprint. Um, and then represent the fingerprint by the set of grid squares in which uh, you have minutia. And uh, it turns out because sometimes the, the alignment isn't perfect, uh, when you have a minutia near the edge of a or the corner of a um, uh, of a grid square, you might want to pretend it's in both that grid square and its neighbors. Uh, so this this is sort of a, a point. This is this is a ridge uh, ridges that that uh, come together or uh, sp uh, or split depending on which way you're going. Uh, the minutia is in that grid square. Uh, but since it's near the corner, you might even want to say it's also in those grid squares. Um, but at any rate, you take the whole fingerprint, some set of the, uh, of the grid squares are, will be declared to have minutia, others not. Okay, so a fingerprint then is a set of grid squares. Um, the number of actual grid squares might be a thousand, so so that uh, for a single fingerprint, so uh, you probably don't need to min hash because the sets themselves uh, are you know are subsets of, of a relatively small universal set. So we're not going to min hash at all. Um, we'll rather represent the fingerprints by bit vectors that have a one. Correspond in a, in a position corresponding to a, a grid square, if there is a minutia in that square, 
or maybe one of the adjacent ones if we decide to allow a minutia to, to carry over to several different squares. Now I'm going to pick some number and I'm going to suggest the 1024 uh, sets of grid squares and uh, again this number in a set could be anything. I'm going to suggest three and we'll, we'll do the arithmetic based on that. Um, and again the, 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 the 1024 sets correspond to 1,024 buckets okay, in, w in which I will throw certain um, uh, uh, throw certain um, uh, fingerprints. Others, the, again, they think of the, you can think of the hash function as one of these 1024 sets of three grid squares. Uh, but here, I'm not hashing every fingerprint to a bucket using one of those 1024 sets. All I'm doing is I'm creating one bucket corresponding to that 1020, the, to, the, to that set of three grid squares. So I'll have a thousand roughly buckets, each of which will contain some of the fingerprints. Okay. See, so this is, this is rather different from the way I described LSH before. Right. Um, uh, I'm still winding up with buckets and my candidates will still be things that appear in the same bucket but now I'm using when one hash function only creates one bucket okay and most things are just thrown out or not in a bucket according to that hash function okay well I, I guess that's what I said okay now I uh, we'll want to do some arithmetic here, so I'm going to assume that the fingerprints have minutia in 20% of the grid squares. Whether they're real, really there, or in a neighboring square, it doesn't matter, but I'm, I'm basically I'm going to assume that each fingerprint has ones in 20% of the grid squares. And I'm going to say that if the fingerprints are actually a match, I'll assume that the chances are 80% that if one has a minutia in a grid square, the other will also have, uh, will, will be deemed to have a one in that grid square as well. Could be that it's really there or it's, it's nearby in one of the neighbors, but uh, the important thing is this, this probability is much bigger than 20%. It's, it's uh, let's say, 80%. Now, Let's look at two random fingerprints that don't, aren't related, don't come from the same finger. What's the probability that they will wind up in the bucket according to one set of three grid squares? Well, it's 0.2 raised to the sixth power because the first fingerprint, in order to be put in the bucket for that set of three, has to have of minutiae in all three and the chances of that happening are 0.2 times 0.2 times 0.2. The second one also has to be uh, have minutiae in all three and its chances are 0.2 times 0.2 times 0.2. And if you look at that, well, it's, it's the number that I have there. It's, it's, it's a really tiny number. Um, but of course, you, you're doing this 1024 times uh, so, you know, you'll still get some number, a decent number of false, uh, false positives. But now let's suppose, though, that, that the two fingerprints come from the same finger. What's the probability that, uh, okay, let's see, what, what, okay, what, what is the probability that these, according to a set of three minutiae, that's a set of three grid squares. Both fingerprints will have minutia in all three. Well, let's look at the first fingerprint. It's still, its chances of having minutia in all three is still 0.2 times 0.2 times 0.2. But given that it has minutia in all three of those squares, the chances that the other one 
will also have is 0.8 times 0.8 times 0.8. This is still a tiny number, but it's a rather bigger number than what I got before. In fact, it's going to be 64 times as big. So it's, it's about, uh, it's well, four-tenths of one percent. Um, well, okay, I guess I sort of explained this. The, the point 0.2 raised to the three powers, the probability of the first print gets thrown into the bucket for this set of three uh, grid squares. And then the point 0.8 is, says that the, same, the, the second one also gets thrown into, the, into that bucket. Um, now, again, as if two fingerprints are the same, what is the probability that at least one of, ten, uh, of 1,024 sets of three points will have all those grid squares covered by both? In other words, that these two fingerprints will actually get thrown into the bucket in common. Well, again, one, mi uh, I don't know if this is, um, okay, one minus 0 0.04096 is the probability that they won't be thrown into the bucket. And then you raise that to the 1024th power, that's, as, that's the probability that they're not thrown into any of the 1024 buckets together. And then one minus that is the probability that they are, that they do become candidates. And if you look at that, the probability that number is about 0.985. Uh, uh, so you get about one and a half percent of the true pairs of fingerprints will be false negatives. We will never see them in the same bucket together. And now for random fingerprints, uh, it's the same formula except uh, you use this number. This is the probability that it's 0.2 to the raised to the sixth power. Uh, this is the probability that they wind up in the same bucket. Uh, and when you do the arithmetic, you get about 6.3%. 6 so that says 6.3% um, of your pairs of fingerprints will actually wind up in the same bucket at, at least once and have to be compared. Okay, That's not great, frankly, because there are so many pairs, even 6% of them are too many to look at. So you probably need to use uh, many more. You, you want to raise this 1024 to be a much higher number. But of course, the more you raise it, the um, uh, the 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 more the more false negatives you get. Okay, so that sort of suggests you want to make sets of more than three positions. I'm not going to go into this, but this is the this is the general direction in which in, in which you want to head. Okay, uh, let's see. So I've got about um, I've got about seven minutes to tell you the last story. Uh, this was uh, actually, uh, again, another real story. Uh, they, the the poli-sci department at Stanford asked some computer scientists uh, to help them identifying duplicate on, online uh, news articles. As they, as they had a collection of news articles. Uh, many of them were sort of, they sort of came from the same. So it's sort of like the plagiarism problem Except it's not really plagiarism. It was uh, the, the common, you know, the, the typically it's uh, Associated Press puts out a story. This gets picked up by a thousand different news sources. Uh, they each um, do something to the story uh, that makes it look slightly different, but not all that different. Okay, so uh, for example, uh, a newspaper is going to uh, add to the article itself uh, something that's unique, uh, you know, uh, identifying the uh, the news source itself. They may put ads on the page. Uh, they may link to other articles that uh, that they're publishing, and 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 each news source will link to different articles. Uh, and, and then finally, the article itself may be altered. Typically, it's okay if a newspaper decides not to run the whole article, but to truncate it or, or leave out certain paragraphs. Okay, so I want you to just get the picture that 
that there's a lot of going to be a lot of text in common, but also a lot of stuff that isn't common. Uh, you know, the ads, the the links, the logos, uh, and again, maybe part of the te of the text itself. Um, so, uh, the the computer science uh, team actually didn't know about locality sensitive hashing, and this, of course, is a a common problem that I, that I face that people who know about locality sensitive hashing can do things that that others cannot um, so they, they they invented shingling themselves uh, but they didn't do min hashing they didn't do uh, locality sensitive hashing um, but they also when they invented shingling they didn't shingle the way I described it where shingle is is a sequence of characters they had a a, a different method, which actually looks pretty uh, pretty interesting uh, in this particular case. They also had a, a very simple version of locality sensitive hashing, where uh, they simply sorted the articles by length and only looked at at only compared articles if they were within ten percent of each other in length, and that's fine unless. Um, you know, one had a lot more ads than the other, or uh, the one uh, source had chopped the the the, the uh, article in half. Um, so I told them about uh, LSH and and how to do it, uh, and they implemented it, um, and they found that as long as the similarity was below eighty percent, that this was in fact a, a, a more efficient way and more accurate way to to work. Uh, and, and let me explain that that's, uh, that's actually not a surprise to me because there, there are other methods that work for similarities that are really high. And it's, uh, it's actually described in the book, uh, the section is 3.9, I'm not going to do it here. Uh, uh, but uh, at any rate, the, f the first time I, I, uh, when I told them about, uh, told them the story, uh, of, of LSH, uh, they came back and they said, oh, this is just taking way too much time. Uh, okay, and it turns out, again, that the mistake they were making was the thing I warned you not to do, which is when you do min hashing, uh, you have to do it row by row. You try to do it column by column, then you're computing the same hash function over and over again. Um, and um, again, as in most cases, the data is given to you column by column. Again, a column corresponds to a, news, uh, to a single occurrence of a newspaper article. Uh, you need to basically sort shingle, take the shingle column matrix, a sing shingle article matrix, and sort it by not not by article but by uh, by shingle okay and once they did that they said well it's really fast and it was um, but let me tell you about the shingling technique they used because I think in this case at least and maybe in other cases it's a really good idea okay um, what they had observed was okay there, there's this notion of a stop word which is just a very common word the and a it. Um, um, news articles have a lot of stop words because they're they're full prose. Ads tend not to. Okay, not to have the stop words. They, they have a, an, um, you know, well, here's an example. In an ad, I might say, "Buy Sudzo." Okay, no stop words. Uh, Whereas if I'm talking to you about the advantages of certain laundry products, uh, I might say what I have here. I recommend that you buy Sudzo for your laundry. And I've, I've put in, in yellow what I would imagine would be the stop words in any, any reasonable uh, uh, set of stop words. So there are, lot, there, there are no stop words in the ad statement and lots of them in ordinary text. So for them, a shingle was actually th a, a sequence of three words consisting of a stop word and whatever 
the next two words were that followed it. So, for example, in, in that case, you'd get one shingle would be, I recommend that. Another would be, that you buy. Then you buy Sudzo for your laundry and your laundry blank, I guess. Okay. Um, and you know, so so why why this actually worked was, bec it 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 forced most of the shingles to come from the article itself rather than things that were not article that were ad. Um, so if I had two two pages that had the same article with different ads, the number of shingles that they would likely have in common would be much higher. And then if I had two pages that had identical ads, but different articles. Again, because most of the shingles come from the article. And you don't have to know what's ad and what's article. Uh, it's just sort of, the, to them, it was the nature of the text that appeared in, in each that, uh, again, that, that did the, the that biased in, in, in favor of, uh, in favor of, of text from the article. Okay, well, that's that. Uh, oh, okay, I'm about two minutes over. So we can now have our coffee break, I guess. Exactly. Yes? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so really sort of almo almo almost, almost got it. Uh, got it right. Okay, and uh, I will leave this. So and we'll come back, start talking about data streams. <laughs>